Giuseppe Mazzini. Nationalism, by whatever name used to describe it, is almost as old as civilization itself. It has generally arisen under two kinds of circumstances, and hence has taken two different forms. One is what might be called defensive nationalism, the search for a national heritage and unity by a politically weak people who have been dominated and often oppressed by an outside power. The second is what can be called aggressive nationalism, the attempt by a growing political power to exercise dominion over its weaker neighbors. Following the collapse of the Napoleonic Empire in Europe, many peoples, particularly those who felt a cultural identity but had not achieved a national political unity, developed a strong nationalistic movement. These were primarily of the defensive type. These people, so long submerged, longed for their own place in the sun. In later times, particularly in our own century, we have witnessed many examples of aggressive nationalism. As a result, the, world na the word nationalism itself has been taken on, is taken on a negative connotation and has often been replaced, particularly by those engaged in it, by some euphemistic alternative, the favored term usually being patriotism. Although nationalism was rampant in Europe throughout most of the 19th century, its most important effects were found in the unification of Germany and Italy. A prominent figure in the unification movement in Italy, to which he was devoted much of his life, was Giuseppe Mazzini. But Mazzini was too broad an intellect to limit his efforts to his own country. Rather, he looked beyond the boundaries of Italy to urge the development of an international community in which all people would live together in freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Italy, he believed, should, be, should first unite to form one country and then take the lead in developing the wider association of nations of which he dreamed. More of a prophet than a practical politician, Mazzini did not immediately affect the course of European history as much as more pragmatic champions of nationalism, such as Otto von Bismarck of Germany. Nevertheless, his influence has not been negligible, for we can see him in the precursor of both Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations and the United Nations. Born in Genoa in 1805, Mazzini spent most of his adult life in exile, mainly in France and England. He lived long enough to witness the unification of Italy in the 1860s through the efforts of Cavour and Garibaldi. He died in 1872. Duty, duties to your country. Your first duties, first at least in importance, are, as I have told you, to humanity. You are men before you are citizens or fathers. If you do not embrace the whole human family in your love, if you do not confess your faith in its unity, consequent on the unity of God and in the brotherhood of the peoples who are appointed to reduce that unity to fact, if wherever one of your fellow men groans, wherever the dignity of human nature is violated by falsehood or tyranny, you are not prompt, being able to succor that wretched one, or do not feel yourself called, being able to fight for the purpose of relieving the deceived or oppressed, you disobey your law of life, or do not comprehend the religion which will bless the future. But what can each of you, with his isolated powers, do for the moral improvement, for the progress of humanity? You can, from time to time, give sterile expression to your belief. You may, on some rare occasion, perform an act of charity to a brother not belonging to your own land. No more. Now, charity is not the watchword of the future faith. The watchword of the future faith is association, fraternal cooperation towards a common aim, and this is as much as superior to charity as the work of many uniting to raise with one accord a building for the habitation of all together would be superior to that which you would accomplish by raising a separate hut for each himself, and only helping one another by exchanging stones and bricks and mortar. But divided as you are in language, tendencies, habits, and capacities, you cannot attempt this common work. The individual is too weak and humanity too vast. My God, prays the Brenton Mariner, as he puts out to sea, protect me, my ship is so little, and thy ocean so great. And this, sum, this prayer sums up the condition of each of you, if no means is found of multiplying your forces and your powers of action indefinitely. But God gave you this means when he gave you a country, when you, like a wise, over, when, like a wise overseer of labor, who distributes the different parts of the work according to the capacity of the workmen, he divided humanity into distinct groups upon the face of our globe, and thus planted the seeds of nations. Bad governments have disfigured the design of God, which you may see clearly marked out, as far at least as regards as Europe, by the courses of the great rivers, by the lines of the lofty mountains, and by other geographical conditions. They have disfigured it by conquest, by greed, by jealousy of the just sovereignty of others. Disfigured it so much that today there is perhaps no nation except England and France whose confines correspond to this design. They did not, and they do not, recognize any country except their own families and dynasties, the egoism of caste. But the divine design will infallibly be fulfilled. 
Natural divisions, the innate spontaneous tendencies of the peoples, will replace the arbitrary divisions sanctioned by bad governments. The map of Europe will be remade. The countries of the people will rise, defined by the voice of the free upon the ruins of the countries of kings and privileged castes. Between these countries there will be a harmony and brotherhood, and then the work of humanity for the general amelioration, for the discovery and the application of the real law of life, carried on in association and distributed according to local capacities, will be accomplished by peaceful and progressive development. Then each of you, strong in the affections and in the rise and in the aid of the many millions of men speaking the same language, endowed with the same tendencies, and educated by the same historic tradition, may hope by your personal effort to benefit the whole of humanity. To you who have been born in Italy, God has allowed allotted, as if favoring you specially, the best defined country in Europe. In other lands, marked by more uncertain and more interrupted limits, questions may arise which pacific vote of all will one day solve, but which have cost, and will yet perhaps cost, tears and blood in yours. No, God has stretched around you sublime and indisputable boundaries. On one side, the highest mountains of Europe, the Alps. On the other, the sea, the immeasurable sea. Take a map of Europe and place one point of a pair of compasses in the north part of Italy on Parma. Point the other to the mouth of the Var, the river, and describe a semicircle with it in the direction of the Alps. This point, which will fall when a semicircle is completed upon the north of the Isonzo, will have made the frontier which God has given you. As far as this frontier, your language is spoken and understood. Beyond this, you have no rights. Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and the smaller islands between them and the mainland of Italy belong undeniably to you. Brute force may for a little while contest these frontiers with you, but they have been recognized from from of old by the tacit general consent of the peoples. And the day when, rising with one accord for the final trial, you plant your tricolored flag upon that frontier, the whole of Europe will acclaim re-risen Italy and receive her into the community of the nations. To this final trial, all of your efforts must be directed. I want to pause for a quick second. As you may have gotten from now, Giuseppe Mazzini is from Italy. He's in the middle of the 19th century. We're in the revolutionary time periods, pro-democracy, republics, constitutional monarchy, challenging the absolute rule of kings, what he calls the bad governments run by their family dynasties. And he also mentions the tricolor flag here, which is the liberty, fraternity, brotherhood coming out of the revolutionary movements in 1848, referencing the, th the three goals of the French Revolution from the 1790s. So this is all happening at the same time period, and he's writing at the same time period as these uh, pro-democracy revolts are happening. And he's talking about not only um, rising up to challenge the kings for democracy, but to create nations based on natural frontiers and language. So he's speaking to Italians here. Without country, you have neither name, token, voice, nor rights, no admission as brothers into the fellowship of the peoples. You are the bastards of humanity, soldiers without a banner, Israelites among the nations. You will find neither faith nor protection. None will be sureties for you. Do not beguile yourselves with the hope of emancipation from unjust social conditions if you do not first conquer a country for yourselves. Where there is no country, there is no common agreement to which you can appeal. The egoism of self-interest rules alone, and he who has the upper hand keeps it, since there is no common safeguard for the interests of all. Do not be led away by the idea of improving your material conditions without first solving the national question. You cannot do it. Your industrial associations and your mutual help societies are useful as a means of educating and disciplining yourselves. As an economic fact, they will remain barren until you have an Italy. The economic problem demands, of first and foremost, an increase in capital and production, and while your country is dismembered into separate fragments, while shut off by the barrier of customs, taxes, duties, and artificial difficulties of every sort, you have only restricted markets open to you. You cannot hope for this increase in capital and money. Today, do not delude yourself. You are not the working class of Italy. You are only fractions of that class, powerless, unequal to the great task which you propose to yourselves. Your emancipation, your freedom, can have no practical beginning until a national government, understanding the signs of the time, shall, seated in Rome, formulate a declaration of principles to be the guide for Italian progress, and shall insert into, these, into it these words, Labor is, this, is sacred, and is a source of wealth of Italy. Do not be led astray, then, by hopes of material progress, which in your present condition can only be illusions. Your country alone, the vast and rich Italian country, which stretches from the Alps to the farthest limits of Sicily, can fulfill these hopes. You cannot obtain your rights except by obeying the commands of duty. Be worthy of them, and you will have them. 
Oh, my brothers, love your country. Our country is our home, the home which God has given us, placing therein a numerous family which we love and are loved by, and with which we have more intimate and quicker communion of feeling and then and thought than with others. A family which, by its concentration upon a given spot, and by the homogeneous nature of its elements, is destined for a special kind of activity. Our country is our field of labor. The products of our activity must go forth from it to the benefit of the whole earth. But the instruments of labor which we can use best and most effectively exist in in it, and we, and we may not reject them without being unfaithful to God's purpose and diminishing our own strength. And laboring according to the true principle of our, as of our country, we are laboring for humanity. Our country is the fulcrum of the lever which we, we have to wield for the common good. A fulcrum, by the way, just a quick side effect here, is like the, if it's a seesaw, the fulcrum is like the middle part that holds the whole thing up. So if, you know, the country is a fulcrum of the lever, the fulcrum is like lifting, helping to lift the whole thing up. If we give up this fulcrum, we run the risk of becoming useless to our country and to humanity. Before associating ourselves with the nations which will compose humanity, we must exist as a nation. There can be no association except among equals, and you have no recognized collective existence. Humanity is a great army moving to the conquest of unknown lands against powerful and wary enemies. The peoples are the different corps and divisions of that army. Each has a post entrusted to it, each a special operation to perform it. And the common victory depends on the exactness with which the different operations are carried out. Do not disturb the order of battle. Do not abandon the banner which God has given you. Wherever you may be, into the midst of whatever people circumstances may have driven you, fight for the liberty of that people. If the moment calls for it, but fight as Italians, so that the blood which you shed may win honor and love, not for you only, but for your country. And may the constant thought of your soul be for Italy. May all the acts of your life be worthy of her, and may the standard beneath which you range yourselves to work for humanity be Italy's. Do not say I, say we. Be every one of you an incarnation of your country, and feel himself and make himself responsible for his fellow countrymen. Let each one of you learn to act in such a way that in him men shall respect and love his country. Your country is one and indivisible. As the members of a family cannot rejoice at the common table if one of their number is far away, snatched from the affection of his brothers, so you should have no joy or repose as long as a portion of the territory upon which your language is spoken is separated from the nation. Your country is the token of the mission which God has given you to fulfill humanity. The faculties, the strength of all its sons, should be united for the accomplishment of this mission. A certain number of common duties and rights belong to every man who answers to the answers to the who are you of the other people's I am Italian. Those duties and those rights cannot be represented except by one single authority resulting from your votes. A country must have then a single government. The politicians who call themselves federalists and who could would make Italy into a brotherhood of different states would dismember the country, not understanding the idea of unity. The states into which Italy is divided today are not the creation of our own people. They are the result of the ambitions and calculations of princes or of foreign conquerors and serve no purpose but to flatter the vanity of local aristocracies for which a narrower sphere than the great country is necessary. By the way, one of these princes might be Metternich, right, in his Congress of Vienna and in the local leaders uh, who got a little fiefdom from him in, in Italy. What you, the people, have created, beautified, and consecrated with your affections, with your joys, with your sorrows, and with your blood is the city and the commune, not the province or the state. In the city, in the commune, where your fathers slept, sleep, and where your children will live, where you will exercise your faculties and your personal rights, you live out your lives as individuals. It is of your city that each of you can say what the Venetians say of theirs. Venencia la ex nostra aviano fato nu. In your city you have use of liberty, use of liberty, as in your country. You have need of association, the liberty of the commune, and the unity of the commune. Let that then be your faith. <clears throat> Do not say Rome and Tuscany. Roman Lombardy, Roman Sicily, say Roman Florence, Roman Siena, Roman Leghorn, and so throughout all the communes of Italy. Rome for all that represents Italian life, your commune for whatever represents the individual life. All the other divisions are artificial and are not confirmed by your national tradition. A country is a fellowship of free and equal men bound together in a brotherly concord of labor towards a single end. You must make it and maintain it such. 
A country is not an ag aggregation. It is association. There is no true country without a uniform right. There is no true country where the uniformity of that right is violated by the existence of caste, privilege, and inequality, where the powers and faculties of a large number of individuals are suppressed or dormant, where there is no common principle accepted, recognized, and developed by all. In such a state of things, there can be no nation, no people, but only a multitude, a fortuitous agglomeration of men whom circumstances have brought together and different circumstances will separate. In the name of your love for your country, you must combat without truce the existence of every privilege every inequality upon the soil which has given you birth. One privilege only is lawful, the privilege of genius, when genius reveals itself in the brotherhood with virtue. But it is a privilege conceded <clears throat> by God and not by men. And when you, as knowledge, when you acknowledge it and follow its inspiration, you acknowledge it freely by the exercise of your own reason and your own choice. Whatever privilege claims your submission in virtue of force or heredity, or any right which is not a common right, is a usurpation and a tyranny, and you want to combat it and annihilate it. Your country should be your temple, God at the summit, a people of equals at the base. Do not accept any for other formula, any other moral law, if you do not want to dishonor your country and yourselves. Let the secondary laws for the gradual regulation of your existence by the progressive applications of the supreme law. So a quick pause here, right? This is very much in the spirit of moving towards democratic people's participation, right, consent of the governed, get, getting rid of privilege, <clears throat> very revolutionary. The, the, the big difference so far, what we're seeing with Mazzini here, is that he's talking about creating a nation based on uh, ethnicity, race, culture, that kind of stuff. And in order that they should be so, it is necessary that all should contribute to the making of them. The laws made by one faction of the citizens only can never be the nature of things, and men do otherwise than recollect the thoughts and inspirations and desires of that faction. They represent not the whole country, but a third, a fourth part, a class, a zone of the country. The law must express the general aspiration, promote the good of all, respond to a beat of the nation's heart. <clears throat> the whole nation, therefore, should be directly or indirectly the legislator. By yielding this mission to a few men, you put the egoism of one class in the place of the country, which is the union of all classes. <clears throat> a country is not a mere territory. The particular territory is only its foundation. The country is the idea which rises upon that foundation. It is the sentiment of love, the sense of fellowship which binds together all the sons of that territory. So long as a single one of your brothers is not represented by his own vote in the development of a national life, so long as a single one vegetates uneducated among the educated, so long as a single one able and willing to work languages in poverty for want of work, you have, got, you have not got a country such as it ought to be, the country of all and for all. <clears throat> Votes, education, work are the main three main pillars of the nation. Do not rest until your hands have solidly erected them. <clears throat> and when they have been erected, when you have secured for every one of you food for both body and soul, when freely united, entwining your rights, your right hand like brothers round a beloved mother, you advance in beautiful and holy concord towards the development of your faculties and the fulfillment of the Italian mission. Remember that the mission, that that mission, is the moral unity of Europe. Remember the immense duties upon which it imposes upon you. Sorry, Italy is the only land that has twice uttered the great word of unification to the disjoined nations. Twice Rome has been the metropolis, the temple of the European world. The first time when our conquering eagles tra traversed <clears throat> the known world from end to end and prepared it for union by introducing civilized institution. The second time when, after the northern conquerors had themselves been subdued by the potency of nature, of great memories and of religious inspiration, the genius of Italy incarnated itself in the papacy, the Catholic Church, Pope, Rome, and undertook the solemn mission, abandoned four centuries ago, of preaching the union of souls to the people of the Christian world. Today, a third mission is dawning for our Italy, as much vaster than those of old as the Italian people. The free and united country, which you are going to, to found, will be greater and more powerful than Caesars or Popes. The present presentment of this mission agitates Europe and keeps an eye on the thought of nations chained to Italy. Your duties to your country are proportioned to the loftiness of this mission. You have to keep it pure from egoism, uncontaminated by falsehood and by the arts of that political Jesuitism, which they call diplomacy. The government of the country will be based through your labors upon the worship of principles, not upon the idolatrous worship of interests and of opportunity. There are countries in Europe where liberty is sacred within, but is systematically violated without. Peoples who say truth is one thing, utility another, theory is one thing, practice another. Those countries will have inevitably to expiate, <clears throat> ex 
expatiate their, their guilt in long isolation, oppression, and anarchy. But you know the mission of our country and will pursue another path. Through you, Italy will have, with one only God in the heavens, one only truth, one only faith, one only rule of political life upon earth. Upon the edifice, sublimer than capital or Vatican, which the people of Italy will raise, you will plant the banner of liberty and of association, brotherhood, so that it shines in the sight of all the nations. Nor will you lower it ever for terror or despots or lust for gains of the day. You will have boldness as you have faith. You will speak out aloud to the world and to those who call themselves the lords of the world, the thought which thrills the heart of Italy. You will never deny the sister nations. The life of the country shall grow through you in beauty and in strength, free from servile fears and the hesitations of doubt, keeping as its foundation the people, as its rule the consequence of its principles logically deduced and energetically applied, as its strength the strength of all, as its outcome the amelioration the help of all, as the, its end its goal the fulfillment of the mission which God has given it. And because you will be ready to die for humanity, the life of your country will be immortal."